several institutes, I would say very respected private college, just in the center of Prague and in the center of Europe and in the center of the whole world. Uh, I hope you, you allow me to, to uh, design my welcome speech in, in a little bit wider, wider content and uh, bilingual. Uh, the reason why in uh, wider content, I would, like you, uh, let, uh, I would like you to know who we are, what we do, and why we do what we do. And the second, uh, this evening is going to be interpreted. So if I s continue in Czech, it can be something like a small warm up for our interpreters to be ready for, for the, the, the speech. Cevro uh, Institute is a small high school která nabízí vzdělání ve třech základních pilířích. Je to politologie mezinárodní vztahy, právo veřejné i soukromé a hospodářská politika, tedy ekonomická studia. Jedním z oborů, na které se zaměřujeme a chceme dále rozvíjet, jsou bezpečnostní studia. A jsem velmi rád, že vám mohu sdělit, že Zájem o tento druh vzdělání na úrovni magisterského vzdělání nám dává sílu a entuziasmus v tom smyslu, aby jsme se pokoušeli ho dále rozvíjet. Dnešní přednáška našeho hosta zapadá do velmi bohatého týdne pro naši vysokou školu. Tento týden Vysoká škola Cevro Institut podepsala memorandum o spolupráci s Národním bezpečnostním úřadem a kromě témat ochrany info, uh, utajovaných informací se budeme společně zaměřovat i na problematiku kybernetické bezpečnosti. Uh, z Izraele se právě vrátil Saša Vondrák a, a to s tímto dokumentem, což je memorandum, které uzavřela naše vysoká škola s jednou nejvýznamnějších soukromých izraelských vysokých škol Interdisciplinary Center. A díky této spolupráci věřím, že na této půdě budeme moci přivítat studenty, ale nejenom studenty, ale také experty z této vysoké školy. A pokud máte zájem se prvních vlaštovek zúčastnit, vlaštovek, které přinesou tuto spolupráci, tak již v červnu uvítáme první experty na problematiku terorismu na půdě naší vysoké školy a věřím, že to bude zajímavé nejenom pro studenty, pedagogy, nejenom pro rozvědčíky a kontrarozvědčíky a policisty a, a, a vojáky, ale také, také pro vás všechny. Uh, as, I, as I told you in the beginning, my, my welcome speech will be bilingual, so let me finish it in, in English. Possibly you know the situation that uh, when you're going to meet a person who you don't know personally, but you heard a lot about the person, you read maybe more about the person, and you are curious if everything you read and heard are the rumors, fairy tale, or the truth. I was in the same position before I'm, uh, I was meeting uh, our, our guest, so I was really surprised. Uh, I do believe that you heard a little bit or you heard about our guest. I believe that you read a lot of about our guest, but I want to assure you that is nothing than the personal knowledge uh, of such excellent person I have the honor to welcome here on the board. Dan, it's really a pleasure uh, to have you here. And I hope that you, you're going to spend a nice time with us. And also, we hope that we're going to spend a nice time with you. Welcome all of you here. And I do believe that I don't see you for the last time. Have a nice evening. So good afternoon, everybody. 
My duty here is to introduce our main guest, and I will gladly do it as somebody who just came back from Herzliya, from Israel. I have spent the night in this famous overnight flight, so I did not sleep, but when I talk this to uh, Dan, who came for another big event which is taking place in Prague, is the UCLA conference on the Middle East. Uh, he told me that he did not sleep two nights, so you will see what does it mean, the effect not not sleeping two nights. I think <laughs> uh, you will not recognize this for sure. Uh, but first of all, it's my mm, privilege to uh, welcome some special guests here, Ambassador Gary Koren, the new ambassador of Israel in Prague, so welcome. I think it's already the second time when you are here. Uh, we have uh, at least two former uh, ambassadors of the Czech Republic in Israel. Uh, first and foremost, Tomáš Poyar is among us, who you could read today that he's going to join our uh, strength here uh, pretty soon. And uh, I have to thank uh, Tomáš because he has played an instrumental role in not just bringing Dan Shiftan to Prague, but also bringing this all UCL circus to, uh, to Prague. I think this how is energetic uh, work. Uh, Prague would not host uh, this event. Uh, it's great to have uh, Petr Nechas here among us, uh, the former prime minister. Uh, I would like to... <laughs> welcome also, Brigadier General uh, Schwartz, the head of the intelligence service. It's uh, logical because uh, Dan uh, Shiftan is uh, regularly offering uh, his uh, briefings to many institutions uh, in America, in Europe. Uh, in fact, he has uh, briefed uh, right on the way here uh, the three committees of the Czech Parliament, the foreign European and defense. Uh, I think uh, I cannot imagine to start this year with a public lecture better than uh, with a special guest uh, from Israel. My feeling just spending uh, two, day, two days in Herzliya with their ICT program, this is a fantastic institution and if the Czechs uh, uh, may to learn really somewhere something. It's in the Israel. A lot of common things, you know, the sense of humor, sense of deep skepticism, I guess you both will see uh, today. Dan uh, Shiftan uh, uh, right now uh, uh, has uh, two uh, major uh, areas uh, of his assignment. He is director of of the National Security Studies Center at the University of Haifa in Israel, and he's also a professor uh, at the Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. Uh, but in the past, uh, uh, he was regularly advising the Israeli Defense Forces. Uh, he was a top advisor to the two Israeli Prime Ministers, um, Yitzhak Rabin, and Ariel Sharon, and he's uh, pretty well known in uh, the international community, uh, mostly because of uh, two, uh, two things. First, uh, he's among the key architects of uh, the disengagement strategy. So what, if you remember what Ariel Sharon has, when he has decided to uh, leave Gaza, uh, as it is, uh, it was to very much extend uh, uh, the brain of, uh, of Dan uh, Shiftan. And uh, he has jumped also uh, regularly into a public uh, global discussion three years ago when this so-called Arab Spring has erupted and you know you could see you know many uh, idealists dancing that you know the miracle has happened and 
It's something like 1989 in Europe. And there were some skeptical voices. I belong to them. And, uh, you know, occasionally uh, it was uh, a really pleasure to uh, uh, listen to the voice of, uh, of uh, uh, Dan Shiftan, which uh, was lacking this uh, uh, naivete which you could uh, uh, see in uh, many, uh, uh, many uh, discussions, both in Europe as well as in uh, the United States. Uh, but I'm not here to speak. Uh, you are here to speak. So once again, uh, please welcome here and give a welcome to our main guest, Dan Shiftan. Thank you. Uh, I intend to speak uh, today primarily about the Middle East in general and introduce Israel into the picture only from time to time and at the end of the lecture. But I would like to start with an Israeli uh, perspective and actually it's a joke of angels approaching the Almighty one day and saying, you've promised the Jews so much and you love them and you've chosen them as your people. It's not fair to other peoples. Why should they get so much of your love? And it is not balanced by anything. And God responded, wait until you see who I've given them as neighbors. And I think that this is a very good beginning to speak about the Middle East today. Not only from an Israeli perspective, but if you look at this region, it's actually tragic because this region is hopeless. You know, we speak about failing states, Somalia being a failing state, there are many other states, but the term was discussed very often concerning Somalia. The Arab Middle East is to a very large extent a failing region. And here is the interesting thing. The Arabs are beginning to understand it and to accept it as a reality. Namely, that we're not speaking about a crisis. Okay, there's a revolution. After a revolution, things are very difficult. It takes time until a new reality establishes itself. It happened in many other places. We know that after the French Revolution, immediately things were not exactly as happy as people um, expected when they stormed the Bastille. But what is happening in the Middle East is not a crisis. It is not something that will go away. The negative elements that we'll see today is not something that will go away very soon. The problems of the region are structural. And let me tell you first of all how deep it goes and then to try and explain some of the reasons that A, things are very bad, and B, they will not get better soon. I don't know what will happen in 200 years. I don't think anybody can say anything with any certainty. If we want to know what will happen very, uh, in 200 years, I think we should ask Shimon Peres. He will still be president of Israel, and he always knows what happens hundreds of years from now. I disagree with him on practically every one of his predictions. But if you want to look at a realistic future, 20, 30 years of now, one generation, two generations from today, we have a structural problem in the region. First of all, the Arab states, you can say, are disintegrating. This is one way of putting it. But another way of putting it was, it was never anything like a nation state to begin with. We pretended it's a nation state. When these states were first established almost 100 years ago after the First World War, we believed that, okay, it will take some time until they come into their own, until they get some common solidarity between their people, until they sort out their problems and the um, initial problems are being addressed. But then they will establish themselves as nation states in the modern sense of the term. With the possible exception of Egypt, and I should even say half exception of Egypt. What we have in the Middle East are not even nation states. These are tribes with primordial loyalties, 
with extended families, with structures that are not conducive to the establishment of one functioning state. It is not only that today there is no such thing as Syria. There has never been anything like Syria or Lebanon or Iraq. Again, Egypt is half an exception. In Morocco, you have something that you can say is functioning. In Jordan, for a while, it is working always on the edge. But if you look at the root, you will see a problem of nations who have not been able to deal with the challenges of the modern world. And I think it would be an understatement to say that the Arabs are not dealing very effectively with the challenges of the 21st century. I don't think they're dealing very effectively with the challenges of the 20th century. Some would even say the 19th century, but certainly not the 20th or the 21st century. We are speaking of countries who are getting worse and worse in terms of their ability to adapt themselves to it. Let me perhaps demonstrate it. In 1950, not very long ago, you could find Egypt, Taiwan, Singapore, Israel, more or less on the same level in the 1950s. Today, everybody except Egypt is much, much better than it used to be. And Egypt is much worse than it used to be in terms of its ability to deal with 85, 90 million people. Egypt has no solution. And again, Egypt is the only thing that even resembles an entity that can function as one entity. There has always been an Egypt. 7,000 years ago, 5,000 years ago. I suppose there will be an Egypt in the past, in, in the future. Not a Syria, not an Iraq. I doubt if a Lebanon. But Egypt will be there. But this Egypt is hopeless. It is hopeless because it is too big to be helped from the outside and too deep in trouble to be helped from the inside. You can help a country like Tunisia. It is small. You can, the Palestinians can continue to live at everybody else's expense. It's a tradition. But when it comes to Egypt, 90 million people, you cannot help from the outside. Even if Saudi Arabia gives $12 billion, it's a huge sum of money. Say they give it every year. The choice of Egypt is put it into subsidies, food subsidies, and then it disappears into a black hole and doesn't contribute anything for the next year. Or don't put it into food subsidies and millions of people go hungry, literally have nothing to eat. And of course, riot in the street. But there is something that is more deep and more serious than the economic crisis. The economic crisis is terrible. But look at Arab states who are unbelievably rich thanks to their oil. They're also failing. So the problem is not money. The problem is not occupation. Take countries who have never been occupied, not only never been occupied by Israel, but never been occupied by the British or the French. So you can't blame colonialism. By the way, this blaming of colonialism is getting a bit old. The Arabs say today that they failed because they had 30 years of <coughs> colonialism light. Look at India. They had hundreds of years of much more vicious colonialism, and India is succeeding. And when you look at these post-colonial countries, you see that some want to succeed, and others want to have a good excuse why they constantly fail. And the Arab world belongs to the second category. They have excellent excuses why, they've, why they're all, always failing. There is an understanding in the Arab world that the problem is deeper and the problem is cultural. If you want to be able to deal with the modern world, you must be in one way or another pluralistic. If you want to deal with the challenges of the 21st century, you must find a place for half the society that in the Arab world is not being brought into um, 
uh, effect as a natural resource, as a human resource into the picture. This is not happening in the Arab world. And the Arabs know what is wrong with them. They speak about it. By the way, you're not supposed to speak about it in American universities, in European universities. I'm sorry to say even in Israeli universities it becomes difficult to say anything about the Arabs that is not favorable because immediately the uh, supporters of Edward Said will jump and call you orient orientalist or racist and this immediately stops every discussion. But in the Arab world itself there is the understanding that there is a cultural problem and a very serious one and one that the Arabs are not willing to deal with. Now, did the people who go into Tahrir Square initially want to change these things? Yes. I met them here in Prague in 2011 and I told them, you will fail, you will be defeated. The chances that you will succeed are zero. Not because you're not nice guys, but because you are nice guys. Because you actually want to do the right thing in Egypt, but you don't have a political and cultural hinterland in the Egyptian society. And therefore, anything that will happen in Egypt will be a balance between two negative forces, a military dictatorship or the Muslim Brothers, which is an even worse version of authoritarianism and totalitarianism. And unfortunately, there is no way out because Egypt is too big to be saved from the outside, and from the inside you need a cultural revolution, and the mainstream of the Egyptian society is not willing to pay the price of this uh, cultural revolution. It is not about to happen. Now, can things change? I constantly, saying what I'm saying today, for decades, I've been constantly confronted with the allegation, you are static. You are not speaking about change, you are speaking about the reality today. And I kept telling people, it is not that change can come, it is here. The Middle East is constantly changing, only it is changing for the worse. The most important change in the Arab world in the last 50, 60 years is the rise of radical Islam. It's a change, but it's a negative change. The assumption that change must be for the better is a remnant of what we used to believe at the end of the 19th century, that there is pro progress out there, and by definition, if things change, they must change positively. Me, I'm always reminded of this saying, one day I was sitting lonely and depressed in my room, and then a voice came out of the darkness and said, cheer up, things could be worse. So I cheered up, and sure enough, things did get worse. And they're getting worse all the time. Not only if change comes, it doesn't have to be for the better, but when change is coming, when we've seen it coming, it has been a change in the direction of less pluralism. Egypt today is less pluralistic than it was three years ago and also less pluralistic than it was in the 1920s and the 1930s when they told us that here you have in Egypt a multi-party system and a parliament, it's only a question of time, they will become a more open and more pluralistic regime and society. And it is not an accident that this very fragile form of multi-party party system lost Egypt to a military dictatorship of Gamal Abdel Nasser. And it's not an accident that what started as an outburst of very positive emotions ended the way it is today and my guess is we are not to see anything very good in the, very, in the future. You look at this region let me again here and there inject an Israeli perspective. Some of these countries are enemies of Israel of the worst kind. But from an Israeli perspective, 
things are so bad in these countries, enemy countries, that I'm worried as an Israeli. It's not good for Israel. Because if you had a situation in Syria where you had a barbaric dictatorship of Assad, now things are even worse than they used to be, and the future promises to be even worse than what we have today. And the most ridiculous thing you can see is the kind of interpretations that you have in the United States, in Europe, but I'm surprised to see even with a few Israelis, when they get indications that look good but are very superficial. Let me give you an example. I had to struggle not only with my students but also with some elements in our um, intelligence establishment in Israel when 12 years ago people used to tell me, even in Israel, let alone in Europe that never understands what's going on in the Middle East, but even in Israel. And people were telling me, now Syria is going to be modernized because look, here is Assad. He is an eye doctor, Bashar. He lives in London. He has a good looking wife. He speaks English and he's on the internet. Wow, he's on the internet. He's modern, he's open, the internet is open. And I said to them, my answer was pedophilia. Give the internet to a pedophile. What will he be looking on the internet? Will he be punching in Voltaire, Rousseau, <laughs> waiting to see what comes up and then immediately change his political system? Or being a pedophile, he will look for you know what? And when you're a dictator, what do you do with the, with the internet? You spy on your people. When you're a terrorist, what do you do with the internet? You look for instructions to do bombs. The internet today is one of the most important vehicles for terrorism. We confuse the instrument with the culture that it serves. Everybody uses uses an instrument for whatever he culturally is committed to. And when you're a dictator, and when you're a society that treats its people, its women, like cattle, you expose yourself to the internet and you lo look in the internet for what will strengthen your cultural ideas. So when people come to me with these great hopes, you know, when people come to me and say, spring in the air. My response is, why the hell should I? The idea is that just look for something that worked for us and it will work for them because after all, people are people. People have different cultures. Saddam Hussein and Mother Teresa are not identical. When you look at the Middle East, you find precious little Mother Teresa and quite a lot of Saddam Hussein. Now, are there decent Arabs committed to democracy and pluralism? Yes, I know hundreds of them personally. I bring many of them to Prague. I just had dinner with some of them. Okay? So, do I know hundreds of them? Do I know that they exist? Do they write? Do they express themselves? Yes. Recently, I spoke to one of them a few years ago, and I said to him, Sadadin, every time I see you, it warms my heart. And he said to me, don't misunderstand the situation. People like me in the Arab world are not marginal. We are negligible. We cannot bring the strata, the, the stratum that needs to take this up to a level where a nation can adopt it, it isn't there. So I don't expect anything good to come out of it in the near future. I hope, this is my best hope, that Jordan will survive, that Morocco will survive. By the way, not getting some American recipe of democracy, bringing democracy to the Middle East, bringing democracy to the Arab world, 
I think if somebody can bring patience to Israel, he can bring democracy to the Arab world. Try it in Israel first. Try to bring patience to the Israelis and see if it works. Or gemütlichkeit to the Israelis. See if it works. I don't think so. Okay? It is not in the making. And if we sit there waiting for somebody, for something that is not going to happen, we are not helping it happen just by wishing it to be true. And it cannot be helped from the outside in the stupid way that it was tried in Iraq. And it cannot be helped in the even dumber way that it was tried in Libya. Let's take a dictatorship, bomb them, and then we will get a democracy. What were the choices in Libya? A repulsive dictator, crazy, I think, by every definition of the term, that was a terrible ruler for 40 years, that's very bad, and the only realistic alternative is dictatorship with anarchy. Now, what do you want? Dictatorship without anarchy or dictatorship with anarchy? Is it a good choice? No, it's a terrible choice. Is it the only choice that you get in the Arab world at the moment? Yes. Do you have islands in the Arab world where things are different? Jordan is one. Morocco is another. Here and there in the Persian Gulf, you can find. Yes, but look at the mainstream of the Arab world. Don't have illusions about this region. And speaking of illusions, it brings me to Europe. I mean, I cannot say the word illusions without immediately thinking of Europe. Because if there is one thing that is completely cut off from reality out there in La La Land, it is the attitudes that the educated elite in Europe has about the Middle East. I told people in Parliament today something, so I repeat it again, but you haven't heard it. I think it is uh, interesting. I was um, invited by a very senior uh, European to speak to him, and he made the mistake of being polite to me, and he asked me, how was your flight, uh, how long have you been here, and so on. So I said to him, you know, I came here three days ago to prepare myself to the meeting with you. And he was very flattered. And he said, how did you prepare yourself? I said, I went to Disneyland. I went to Euro Disney. Because if I don't go to Disneyland, I can't understand what you guys are saying about the Middle East. Okay? Because you're really out there with perceptions of the Middle East that are politically correct, namely completely detached from reality. It's the same thing. Political correctness and detachment from reality are just two synonyms for, for the same term. Because if you want to be nice and not to insult anybody, you are not looking analytically at the picture, you are looking ideologically at a picture. When I'm speaking to a European about the Middle East and I ask him, if A and B happens, what do you expect to happen? In other words, I'm asking him an analytical question. Usually his response starts either with the words, I believe, or even worse, with the words, I want to believe that. And I keep telling him, look, the question of what you believe is something that your mother should be very interested in. I'm not, okay? If you want to tell me what the Arabs, in your view, have deep in their heart, speak to their cardiologist. I'm not interested. I'm asking you, what do you think analytically will happen? You're a sophisticated person. You're knowledgeable about the Middle East. Give me an assessment, an analytical assessment. And he speaks to me in theological terms. And then the discussion becomes theologic because the question is not what can happen under certain circumstances, but what you believe or 
what you want to believe. Now, this must be, again, fascinating for your loved ones, what you want to believe. Why should anybody be interested in what you want to believe? The problem is that Europe tells itself a fairy tale. And the fairy tale is the following. We used to be barbarians, in parentheses, like you, the Israelis. We used to kill each other. We used to believe that force is the answer. And then we got Hitler and we learned. And now we are no longer believers in the use of force, but in dialogue. Let's discuss issues. Let's sit around the table. And he who has the best argument will win the day and we will reach an agreement because people want to live together, don't they? No, they don't. But let's have a dialogue. Now, we have a very famous sketch in Israel of an Arab teacher trying to teach Hamlet in English in an Arab village. And in one uh, phase, the teacher explains the students, the difference between a monologue and a dialogue. And I think it's very applicable to what we're discussing here when Europeans say, have a dialogue. He says, the difference between a dialogue and a monologue is as follows. Whereas in the case of monologue, there is one person talking to himself. In the case of dialogue, there are two persons talking to themselves. <laughs> okay? In the Middle East, you have a lot of dialogue. And Europeans come and they bring an Arab and an Israeli together, and they say, dialogue. And both sides want to please the European, particularly because he's paying for their non-profit organization, so they dialogue. And they dialogue for him, and he's happy, he has a dialogue, and then they both go and try to kill each other. Okay? So, speaking about the dialogue, you bring a dialogue to Syria today. What are the real options in Syria today? What are the real options in Syria for the last decades that we've seen Syria? Either one barbarian who butchers everybody else, this was Assad father and Assad son, or the private sector takes over, everybody butchers everybody else. Okay, it's called free enterprise. If you look at the Middle East and you ask yourself, go to a poor country, Yemen, one of the poorest countries in the world. In the Yemen, you have an average of three AK-47s per person. Okay, now I understand two assault guns. You need one for the weekend and one for working days. Okay, why the third? I never understood. A guy whose children have nothing to eat will spend a lot of money of getting a third assault rifle, Klashnikov, AK-47. This is Yemen. Do you have nice people in Yemen? Yes. I've recently met a women's rights activist from Yemen who was very impressive and she did great things in Yemen, in the very narrow conf confines that, he, that she could work. Do I have tremendous respect for her? Yes. But she doesn't represent the mainstream of Yemen. And the Europeans will come and finance these things, which is very nice, and assume that it could work. But it can't. And when you come to Mubarak and you say to him, be more democratic, you get the Muslim Brothers. And when you come to Israel and the Palestinians and you say, letting Hamas run in the elections is against the Oslo agreements, so break the agreement before you and bring in Hamas, because Condoleezza Rice believes that after all the Palestinians will have a choice between the absolute barbarism of Hamas that can bring only hardship, or something that she believed is much better, like the PLO, so of course they'll vote for the PLO. And then they vote for Hamas.
And by the way, if they would have had free elections today, they would vote for Hamas again because Hamas represents what they want. Is it a calamity for them? Yes. Do they want it? Yes. How do I know they had free elections? I knew it before they had free elections, but now I have an excuse. I mean, I can prove it to people who may have hesitated before. Or again, let me give you an example. When Israel unilaterally withdrew from the Gaza Strip, and I not only supported it, I helped persuade Sharon to do it. You could look at the Gaza Strip through European eyes and say the following to yourself. Do you have in Gaza half a million unemployed, very skilled construction workers who used to work in Israel and they're unemployed? Yes. Do you need half a million apartments in Gaza to house people who don't have decent housing? Yes. Are the Europeans willing to give 10 billion euros or 10 billion dollars, I can't remember what the sum was, in order to do it? Yes. So what would somebody from a different political culture from what you have in the Middle East do? Take the unemployed, take the money, build the flats. You don't even have to give up the war against Israel. You can do both. Why didn't they do it? Or let me give you another example. I can't remember. Perhaps you can remind me what was the name of the um, a director of the World Bank who was at the time what? Wolfenson. Wolfenson came to the Israeli government and said you have very successful hothouses in the Gaza Strip where they grow flowers and you have markets for it in Europe. Give it to the Palestinians and then the Palestinians will have something that they can benefit from and make a good living from, and then they will not go in the direction of terrorism. So the Israeli government said to him, look, we can't do it because it's not the property of the government, it's the property, the private property of the settlers. So Wolfenson took, I believe, 50 million of his own money, 50 million dollars of his own money. He bought the hothouses from the settlers and he gave it to the Palestinians. What happened the next day? They burned it. What did they do? They started shelling Israeli cities. They have a different priority. Are people who say everybody wants a better life, are they right? Yes. The question, what is a better life? A better life for the people in the Gaza Strip is to kill Jews. It's a better life. This is their perception. So you can tell yourself stories about this region, about Egypt, about Syria, about um, Iraq, but unfortunately, every time they come to a test, they prove the, ex the extreme opposite of what you expected. Now, there used to be a time when the Europeans didn't know what they were doing, but the Americans knew what they were doing. Take the time of Henry Kissinger. He had a very successful policy with a very good understanding of what was happening in the Middle East. But now you have an American president who is a European. And therefore, Europe can no longer afford to be Europe because Europe can afford to be Europe as long as America is America. In other words, somebody doesn't take the European seriously, does the extreme opposite of what the European suggests, and then Europe can be saved. It happened twice, in the Second World War and in the Third World War, also known as the Cold War. Okay? If anybody would have listened to the elites in Europe during the Cold War, Stalin would have taken Paris, okay? And in the time of De Gaulle, I'm not sure that I would be against it, but uh, say, uh, in the final analysis, I would accept that even De Gaulle is better than Stalin. Not the Soviet Union would crumble, the Western democracies would crumble if, God forbid, anybody ever listened 
to the European elites. They're a very consistent bunch. They're always wrong. I'm for consistency. So this idea, and I'm coming again to, a, to an Israeli perspective, when Europeans come to Israel and they say, be like us. We used to be like you, but now we don't want to be barbarians anymore. So we talk. Instead of fighting our neighbors, we become part of our region. Why don't you become part of the Middle East? And imagine how wonderful it would be for Israel to become part of the Middle East. We would be as pluralistic as Syria, as democratic as Iraq, as scientifically advanced as South Yemen, as open to women's rights as Saudi Arabia. It would be heaven. It would be wonderful. What's there in the Middle East not to like? But of course... These guys expect that the Arabs will become like the Israelis. Only the Arabs tell them every day in hundreds of thousands of cases, this is not what we have in mind. When we rebel against Assad, a very small element of us genuinely wants a democracy. But what the mainstream finally ends up with is one of the worst carnages that you can possibly imagine. This is what we see. The Middle East is for the near future. And again, I'm not speaking about eternity. I don't know about eternity. I know what political culture is. I don't know what a mentality is. I have no mentalometer. I don't know, I can't say this will be forever. But what I can say is that people that are educated in the Arab world today and get only one message that rejects pluralism, that rejects any kind of the values that made Western countries and countries in Asia and even in Africa a success, it is rejected, and what the political culture is, I know. And this political culture, if it changes, it will take generations to change, and in order to change positively, a positive change must start. You know, even if you say a tree will not bear fruit for seven years, you have to plant it first. Not only is the tree not being planted, but trees that have been planted are being plucked out of the ground. And unfortunately, this is what the Middle East is today. And people of goodwill in the Middle East itself, and people of goodwill in Europe, and people of goodwill in the United States, must also look at the realistic reality in the region. Not just ask themselves what they want to believe. They want to believe Friede, Freude, Eierkuchen. They want to believe, alle Menschen werden Brüder, wo dein sanfter Flügel. That's what they want to believe. But it's not there. Let me say something very short about an Israeli perspective. On the one hand, a responsible Israeli must know that for the foreseeable future, we will live in an environment of instability, violence, and hostility. It's a given. Even if we would have been nice, we are not, thank God, but even if we would have been nice, this is our environment. Let me put it to you this way. You look at the Middle East and you see how Arabs treat each other, and you ask yourself, is there any chance they'll treat us better than they treat their own brothers who speak the same language, have the same religion, and have the same political ambitions? And the answer is, you must be an idiot to believe that it can change within the near future. So that's one thing. And the other thing is to ask yourself, if you're stuck in this region, what do you need to do in order to survive. 
And here is the interesting paradox. You need to be at the same time, I stress this point, at the same time, very, very tough and very, very soft. You must be tough on the outside, meaner than a junkyard dog, if need be. Because it's in this region, whoever is not willing to deter the others will be slaughtered. So if you're not strong, you will be slaughtered. Because everybody in this region who's not strong is slaughtered. If he's an Arab, if he's Christian, if he's Muslim, Arabs are open-minded about it. You're weak, you're slaughtered. So that's on the one hand. On the other hand, in the process of defending yourself against barbaric enemies, don't become like them. So you need to be very soft from the inside. And when you look at the Israeli political system, I don't mind the existing situation where the Israeli democracy borders on anarchy. Would it be nice if the Israeli political system were less anarchic? Yes. But you know what? It's safer the way it is today. You need at the same time to be very tough vis-a-vis -vis your enemies and very soft inside to accommodate a very wide variety, including people that you're sure they're wrong, and being wrong can put Israel in danger. You must accommodate everybody so that you can continue to live with a strong society because without a strong society, you cannot survive in this region. And the reason I'm at the same time very pessimistic and very optimistic is that I look at two different perspectives. Concerning the Middle East, I'm very pessimistic. Concerning Israel's ability to deal with the difficulties that we are facing, I'm very optimistic. Would it be nice to have peace in the Middle East? Yes. What are the chances? Zero. So the important thing is, how can you live without peace? Peace is nice. I must quote the second time today my grandmother, a great strategist. She used to say, it's better to be rich, young, and healthy than sick, old, and poor. I think this is a profound strategic insight. So if in addition to everything else we can also get peace, great. Should we make major concessions for it? Yes. Is the Israeli public opinion willing to do it and no government can stop it? Yes. Would I like to see it happening? Yes. Will it happen? No. You ask Israelis, very interesting, Israeli public opinion polls, I'm reflecting here hundreds of, of public opinion polls, they all go in the same direction. You ask do you want to negotiate with the Arabs? Overwhelmingly, the answer is yes. Are you willing to partition the land? Yes. Are you willing today to make more concessions than you were willing a year ago? Yes. Do you expect next year to make more concessions than today? Yes. When you make all these concessions, will it bring peace? No. <laughs> and I love it because it's inconsistency. I can't stand consistent people. The only consistent people I know are 15 years old, okay? You grow up, you get married, I mean, a major trauma. You stop being consistent. A married person is not consistent. I mean, he has learned from bitter experience. You stop believing in solutions. When people speak about the two-state solution, and don't misunderstand, I'm advocating unilateral withdrawal from the overwhelming majority of the territory. So it's not that I'm against the concessions you need to make. But a two-state solution? The only thing in the Middle East that you can be sure 
will not happen is a solution. The only thing in life that has a solution is a crossword puzzle. All real problems in life have no solution. Poverty has no solution. By the way, in this country you were offered the solution. It was called communism. And you know that it can be unpleasant on occasions. Crime has no solution. What can you do? You can bring a bad situation from an intolerable level to a tolerable level. If your law enforcement system is very good, if your education is very good, if your judicial system functions very well, you can bring crime down to an acceptable level. If you have a functioning welfare state, you can bring poverty down to an acceptable level. Don't look for solutions. From an Israeli point of view, most Israelis have abandoned the idea of solution and have abandoned the idea of peace. And I'm delighted. It's good news. Because if Israelis tell me, yes, I will withdraw from the West Bank, but in return for peace, and I know there will be no peace, I'll be stuck with the West Bank forever. So I'd rather have people who don't believe in it. Because it's more realistic. And you can take decisions that are more serious. I was reminded of the situation in Israel. Recently I was in Finland and it was very, very cold. I don't want to say what almost froze on me. And then it came to me that if you ask somebody, imagine you will have to live all your life in 20 centigrade below, out in the open. Good news or bad news? Depending. For a polar bear, it's good news. It's spring. Only 20 below, out in the open. Israel is a polar bear. We have taken it for 140 years. We will take it for the next 140 years. And again, if peace will present itself, fine. If we can reach limited political agreements, like the excellent agreement we've reached with Egypt, with another Arab country, fine, as long as you don't trust it. As long as you don't trust it, peace must be based on mistrust. Once you start trusting in the Middle East, you're doomed. To wrap up what we have discussed here, let me again inject the Israeli element in the form of a joke that I've already told today, but it's so good I can't stop myself from saying it again. It's not funny, but it's good. And the story is about the Almighty getting sick and tired of the human race deciding to bring a flood, but this time a real flood. No Noah, no ark, no way out, no pigeon, no olive branch, just flood. And then he approaches the leaders of the three uh, monotheistic religions and he says, go to your people and tell them that in two weeks everything is over. So the Christian guy comes to his people and he says, we have sinned. In two weeks, everything will be over. So let's pray. Let us do good deeds for two weeks at least. Maybe they let us through the pearly gates. The Muslim comes to his people and he says, we've always been perfect. Let's be perfect for two more weeks and everything will be fine. And the Jew comes to his people and he says, guys, we have two weeks to learn how to live underwater. <laughs> it's a profoundly different perception. And I think that if you want to understand Israel, you need to go back to it. Thank you. Uh, I'll accept uh, any questions. Uh, I would be particularly delighted if I can have challenges, you know, so that I can enjoy myself by uh, making uh, people uh, realize that they don't understand what they're talking to, about. To, so, 
to offer you a time to think about the question, just uh, to correct uh, what I have forgotten uh, in the beginning. First of all, uh, I want to thank Česká spořitelna because they, uh, Pavel Kisilka and Jan Vratník has helped us uh, with bringing uh, this into a uh, reality today. And also I want to thank, uh, I, I, I forgot about Pavel uh, Smutny, the uh, chairman of uh, uh, the Czech-Israeli Chamber of Commerce here in Prague, and Zbigniew Pavlacik, the chairman of uh, the Czech uh, Euro-Atlantic Association, which are now here at Jungmanova 17 as the information center for NATO 2, because they provided uh, their mailing list so to bring also uh, the other people to uh, listen to this uh, fantastic uh, uh, lecture. So now uh, I think you are ready to respond to the questions ahead. and the questions come. There's a microphone coming. Hello, uh, I have a question about Tunisia. I would like to have your analysis about the current uh, constitu constitution being uh, taking place. And can you introduce uh, when yes. starting the question? Um, I mean, who I am? Yeah, yeah, I am from the French Embassy. Yeah. Tunisia is one of the countries that I have hopes for. And the reason is they have adopted the French way of life. Small families, women go to work, um, the um, fanatic religious element kept at bay, and anything that is not Nahda is good. And I think the fact that Nahda lost its controlling uh, position is a, very good, is a very good thing. And Tunisia is small enough to be helped from the outside in the early stages where it's very difficult for a country to keep itself. But again, these are the exceptions in the Arab world, and I'm delighted that this exception exists, and I wish them luck. But I don't know if it will work, because remember in which environment they are. You see, Jordan was a very positive example, but because it was in a very hostile environment, it remained always so cautious that what the king wanted to do he couldn't do in terms of opening up the system. Here is the paradox. In Jordan, the king wanted to open the system up. If you take the best example of November 1989, and then he realized that if he opens it up, the Muslim brothers take over, and then it will be a system of one man, one vote, one time. Because once these guys are in power, it's too late. So the question is not will they reach some kind of an understanding in Tunisia, but what do you do when you have Libya on the one side and Algeria on the other side and the whole Arab world and Arab elites in the wrong place? But I wish very much that they will succeed, and it's not out of the question. Yes, please. Hello, I'm a student of Severn Institute. Uh, I have one if question, a sci-fi if question. Uh, you said uh, the problem in the Middle East is a cultural thing, not a political, uh, political thing. Do you think that if the Israel wasn't, wasn't built by, mostly by European Jews, it will be in the same state as, let's say, Jordan? I, I, I'm not sure I understood. Israel was built by European Jews and? The modern Israel was uh, built by, mostly by European Jews that came up to the World War II. Yes. Do you think that if they wouldn't come and Israel would well, become a, a state, it will be on the same level Look, as Look, if Jordan? the Jews from Europe would not have come, there would not have been an Israel because Jews from the Arab world came much later. And I don't think that the very unique circumstances of the late 1940s would have presented themselves again in the 1960s. The entire Zionist endeavor started in the um, 1880s. So when we came to the establishment of the State of Israel in the middle of the 20th century, we already had 70 years of infrastructure, and I, again, I mean primarily cultural infrastructure, 
that was done almost exclusively by European Jews. So I cannot take it out of the equation. But what I can tell you, and this is tremendously important, that when Jews from the Arab world came, and people were very concerned that because they come from a very different culture, and also remember the largest group came from Morocco, and all the Moroccan elite went to Toronto or to Paris. So the people who came to Israel were to a large extent people who were illiterate with pneumonia. And people believed that this can destroy the Zionist endeavor. And if you look today, with the exception of the people who went to the ultra-Orthodox, that as far as I'm concerned are the enemies of the Jewish people, it, with the exception of these people, the overwhelming majority of Jews from the Arab states have adopted Western European values. And as a matter of fact, they succeeded in doing in less than one generation what the Arabs have failed doing in more than 200 years, namely to adjust themselves to be contributing members of a Western uh, cultural system. So I, I think that the original question cannot be answered because you cannot remove the only thing that made Israel possible because they worked at it for 70 years before the establishment of the State of Israel. I cannot think how it could have developed in a different way. But the important element is that if you have today even a majority of Oriental Jews, not only is it not an impediment, it is an asset. Because what we've had, and this to me is the most important success of the Israeli society, we have had intermarriage between Oriental Jews and Western Jews to the level that the Israeli Bureau of Statistics usually uh, um, came to the conclusion and said openly they can no longer follow what the ethnic origin of different Jews are because they marry among themselves so much that it is no longer possible. This is the enormous achievement of the Israeli society and the Oriental Jews basically adopted the West European values. But remember another thing that is very important. Most Jews who built Israel didn't come from Western Europe. They came from the armpit of Europe. Okay? They came their um, experience was either from a Tsarist system or a communist system, not exactly conducive to communism. So all Israelis, or almost all Israelis, adopted willingly West European values, both the Jews who came from Eastern Europe and Jews who came from the Middle East. So culturally speaking, if Israel has today Western European values, to give you only one example that is very easy to measure, attitude to women. Okay? It's tremendously important. If you only have one yardstick, use this, uh, this yardstick. And today you will find practically no difference. And people who came from cultures where this was not accepted made a dramatic change and they willingly accepted it in spite of the fact that none of them was committed to it before they came to Israel. So I think that this makes the question redundant because it, it puts it in a broader context that answers it in an indirect way. Yes, please. Good afternoon, my name is Vodička. I'm from the Lighthouse Group, developers in Prague. Well, uh, to the topic of this lecture, I think that uh, the situation in Middle East will be stable as long as Israel is strong, military strong, and is capable to defeat itself against everybody there. And uh, I think that for today, Israel, and I am afraid about that a little bit, because Israel cannot be defeated now, but cannot win any other war. So cannot, cannot win any other battle of or war in Middle East, like in future, Six Days War, Yom Kippur War, etc. 
And it's not because Israel is weak, it's because of uh, the Western public opinion, which prevent Israel to show all its mightness, all its strongest. And uh, I think that Israel has to work on Western public opinion, because actually now there is the World War IV between two cultures, Islam and uh, the Western civilization. And we did not realize that in Western countries, but it's true. And Israel actually is on the first line of this war. And we have to support Israel as much as we can. First of all, I very strongly agree to the sentiment of what you said, but I hope you will allow me to modify a little bit your uh, terminology. I agree that um, unless Israel is strong, Israel will not exist. But even if Israel is almighty, it cannot stabilize the Middle East. The Middle East is unstable, period. And the question is not, will Israel stabilize it or a strong Israel stabilize it? The Middle East is unstabilizable, okay? I mean, you, you cannot dry the ocean and you cannot stabilize the Middle East, a at least for the near future. I don't know, uh, perhaps when a new ice age comes or climate change reaches a new peak, we can dry the oceans. I don't know. But if you look again at the only thing that you can say, you can speak intelligently about, namely one generation, two generations, the Middle East cannot be stabilized. But the Middle East can be less of a danger to the whole world with a strong Israel. This is true. Here I agree. So I'm just modifying a little bit this. Now, it is true that Israel cannot win a war anymore the way we did in the 1967 um, uh, war. But you don't need it. Would it be nice? Yes. But the Arabs, I must admit, have succeeded dramatically by taking the war out of the battlefield because they are fighting our civilian population from within their civilian population because they know that in the battlefield they will be defeated because they're backwards. They're incapable of dealing with a modern military machine like the Israeli military machine. So they have taken the war to the civilians. Okay? And I don't just mean the terrorist or the non-state organizations, also the state, uh, uh, also the states in the Middle East. But, you see, Israel doesn't need to win a war. Would it be nice? Yes. All Israel needs is to get enough space between the wars in order to do what Israel is really about. Israel is not about winning wars. Israel is about building a better economy and a better democracy and a better science and a better culture. This is what Israel is about. Can Israel build these things while we're having a war? Yes. Will it be frustrating not to be able to win it like we did in 67? Yes, but you know, we are used to be frustrated. We all have Jewish mothers, so we are used to being frustrated. So, you know, <laughs> one more frustration. Every time I open a European newspaper, I'm, be, I'm frustrated. So, you learn to live with it. You learn to live with frustration. By the way, it's called growing up. Okay? To, to be able to live with frustration. I also don't consider myself to be the forward position of the Western civilization because the Western civilization, a large part of the Western civilization, doesn't want a forward position. Europe is committing suicide. It is committing demographic suicide. It is committing value suicide. Europe doesn't want me to be its forward position, and I will not volunteer to be the forward position without a hinterland. For a forward position, you need a hinterland, and Europe is not the hinterland. Now, speaking about public opinion, let me say something. We are confusing public opinion with journalists. And I wouldn't do so. I don't think it's fair to public opinion. In Europe, it's lost. 
because educated public opinion is either overtly anti-Israeli or at least unfriendly to Israel. But America has the New York Times and it has the American people. And these are two separate things. And Americans do not cheat themselves about the use of force. They understand, even with the current president, the American people understand that without the use of force, you cannot survive. In the United States, there is a healthy society. It is in crisis, but it is a healthy society. In Europe, the society is not healthy. There is something wrong here with the society. And Israel and the United States, perhaps with Canada, perhaps with Australia, perhaps with nations who have not been traumatized by the First World War, which is the watershed in Europe that explains so many things until this very day. Public opinion in the most important democracy is with us. We have between 61 and 64 percent of the American people supporting us. And I think that this is very solid. And even a president who is the most incompetent that I can think of, I already said he's a European, <laughs> cannot undermine the basic and deep support of American public opinion for, uh, for, for Israel. So let's be careful when we use the term public opinion. I know what you meant and you're right. I'm just trying to be more accurate in the use of the, of the term. Yes, please. How do you see the future of Christian communities in the countries like Syria, Lebanon, Iraq, Egypt? Gone. Lost. And I say it with great sorrow. I mean, Christian communities in the Middle East have had an enormous cultural contribution. And in the last um, 150 years, but particularly since Arab countries became independent, they are fleeing from the Middle East. When I sp spoke before about the difficulty in the Middle East uh, in the non-existence of pluralism, it reflects itself in the attitude towards Christians. I believe we used to have in the West Bank something like 12 or 14 percent of Christians. I think we have less than one percent today. I don't see anybody who's willing, I mean, Shiites are not willing to accept Sunnis. Sunnis are not willing to accept Shiites. Will they accept Christians? Will they accept Jews? I don't think so. Christians in the Middle East are very different from the Muslims because when it comes to socio-economic responsibility, they are responsible. Smaller families, women go to work, education a very high priority, okay? This is not what the Arab Muslim Middle East wants. And I'm sorry to say that the Christian community is shrinking constantly and this will continue to, to happen. Yes, please. Good afternoon, Dan. Uh, Daniek Fos. Um, I, have, I thank you for sharing your, your opinion on this whole thing. I feel that the opinion that was provided was maybe slightly one-sided, slightly Israeli-centered, and slightly generalizing towards, towards the uh, Arabian people, uh, which I do not necessarily consider fair, but we probably don't have the time for that. But what I was hoping to kind of um, get from this presentation was uh, some kind of vision that you have because you know you guys are the leaders and if you do not have the vision then who will have the vision so what is the vision for at least improving the states maybe not in the 10 years maybe not 50 maybe in 100 years but what is the vision and the vision is probably not army it's not military it's not war 
So what is your vision for improvement in the region? Thank you. Well, this is a very interesting question in three different categories. First, let me say, we are not the leader. We don't want to be the leader. We are not the leader, and we cannot be the leader. And even if we wanted, we wouldn't be accepted as the leader. So with all due respect to people who say, you can do a lot of things, do it, this was the Zionist illusion 100 years ago when we said, you know, we will come to this region, we will bring down infant mortality, and we did. We will bring down disease, and we did. We will bring in modernity, and we did. We will bring in uh, um, economic prosperity for those who were willing to accept our innovations, and we did. And it didn't make us a leader. If you ask me, I would never have tried. But there were people who suffered from terminal optimism, and they tried, and it failed. And it must have failed, and it cannot succeed. So that's the first point. The second point, what I presented to you today is not an Israeli perspective. It is a perspe an analytical perspective that also reflects the Arab perspective. The only point is that my source for the Arab perspective is spending my life following Arab political literature. And the perspective of the Arabs that you hear in Europe are people who speak here as propagandists, either being Arab propagandists, or worse, university professors from Europe who feel that it is politically correct to say nice things about Arabs that Arabs don't say about themselves. So this is an analytical perspective. And now I come to the last point, which for me is the greatest contribution to our discussion here, vision. I am not a visionary, and I don't look for a vision, and my vision is directed to my people and my culture and my country, because people from one culture cannot have a vision for another culture. I don't have a, a vision about China. I don't have a vision about cultures that I may like but are so different from me that I cannot contribute anything to the vision of Japan. Okay? Now, I respect a lot of things about their culture, but I cannot provide a vision for it. Arabs want a vision. They need a vision of themselves. And if they want a vision, they need to work. And primarily, they need to change. And they need to change what they are not willing to change. And this is their culture. Because if you're saying to yourself, yes, I want to change and I have a good life, but I will treat my women like cattle, look what is happening in Europe. Why do Arabs go to Europe? Because it's a better life. Why don't they have a good life in their own country? Because of their culture. Because even when the country is very rich and it has a lot of oil and it has zillions of dollars, it takes these zillions and it puts them into arms to kill their own people and everybody else. So the reason there is, there is bad life in the Arab world is that Arabs made it bad. To be more specific, Arab culture made it bad. So they want a good life, they go to Europe. Why do you have a good life in Europe? Because there are no Arabs. In other words, Arabs did not create the quality of life in Europe. So they come to Europe. Fine. But then they don't come to Europe and they say, we want to have a good life like the Europeans, and therefore let us live like the Europeans. Let us be pluralistic. Let us treat our women equally. No. They bring wisdom from the Arab world the treatment of women like cattle, they create a, a situation here where everybody, when anybody says something that they don't like, they riot in the streets. When they see a cartoon that they don't like about Muhammad in Denmark, they burn everything they see. Okay? Is it every Arab? No. Is it the mainstream that supports it? Yes. It's not individuals. 
if you want a vision, create a vision for yourself. And I'm not paternalistic. If I want to adopt children, they will be of my own culture, not of a different culture. And by the way, my own culture is not Jewish. My own culture is Western, pluralistic, open societies. This is my culture. I have a vision for this. Unfortunately, Europe is going in the opposite direction than my vision. I'm sorry, okay? But you cannot provide a vision for another country. And when Europeans sit, I'm not saying you, I don't know you, you ask an analytical question, but so I'm not attributing it to you personally. But when Europeans say, we must have a vision for the Arabs because the Arabs were incapable of presenting a vision for themselves, I'm saying, hey, you're making one more mistake in addition to all the other mistakes that you're making when you're approaching the Middle East. And again, when I say you, I don't mean you personally. I mean people who believe that we can provide a vision for them. I don't think that's an option. Yes, please. Thank you very much, uh, Zbigniew Tarant from the University of West Bohemia. Uh, you wanted a uh, challenging question, so let me provide one. Uh, we are here in the Czech Republic, and uh, this is one of the smaller European countries, and uh, your uh, presentation was very theoretical. So let's put it on a practical level. First, how would you evaluate uh, the position of uh, Czech foreign policy and the steps taken by the Czech foreign policy vis-à-vis -vis the Middle Eastern region? And second, uh, if you could suggest, let's say, two or three steps the Czech foreign policy should take right now vis-à-vis -vis the region, vis-à-vis -vis Syria, etc., uh, etc., et what would these steps be? Thank you. I I don't think you're going to like my answer because my suggestion would be don't. In other words, look, the Czech Republic is not a major power. I cannot see anything in the Middle East that the, that the Czech Republic can change. I don't subscribe to this notion of we must do something, this is something, so let's do it, just because you need, and this is my feeling very often about Europeans, that when they come to the Middle East is they need an occupational therapy, okay? They need to do something. They feel, you know, what a beautiful morning, let's do something. In the Middle East, why don't we bring peace, okay? You can't make a difference. You have just been through a terrible period in your history under Nazi Germany and under the um, communist rule. You're building your society. Your point of departure is, in my view, the best in, in Europe that was under uh, Soviet uh, uh, occupation. I think the most important thing is to build your own society and to support nice people like us. Uh, I don't think that you can change the Middle East. What? You will come to Egypt and you will say, ah, you know, Egypt has a problem, the Czech Republic will help. How? Why, what can you do? Or let's have a dialogue and a Czech representative will preside over the dialogue. If you want everybody to laugh at you, have a dialogue. Okay? So what, what is it? Do you have any particular idea that you think the Czech Republic can help? Ah, the, the microphone, yeah. Well, maybe we will have a breakthrough. <laughs> no, uh, I was not uh, talking about any uh, should we interfere or not. I just, we are here in the, in the, uh, in the center of the Europe, in the heart of the Europe, and there is something happening in the Middle East. Okay, should we do something? How should we behave? Okay. Uh, maybe we should not interfere. Okay, is that a good, good strategy? Yes or not? Let me tell you what I think the Czech Republic is trying to do and should continue to try to do. It is to bring Europe back 
to what it used to be, to take it away from the abyss of committing cultural and demographic suicide. Okay? You have here a healthy society. And you know why your society is healthy? Not only because of the qualities of the Czechs. Also, because you still remember that evil is a possibility. In Europe, only Merkel and a few others and the Czechs as a nation remember that there is evil and therefore you need to defend the open society. If you are a West European today, there is no evil. There are just people to have a dialogue with. You want to fix something, fix Europe. I think you can make a contribution to Europe. You don't have to be big to make a contribution to Europe. A small nation like the Czech Republic can do it, and in a way it is already doing it because it is one of the very few that is not willing to join this very simple-minded and immoral approach to the Middle East that we find from coming primarily from Brussels. If I were a European, one of the first things I would do, I would distance myself from Brussels. I would say, you want to coordinate commerce? Fine. But you don't speak for me. Okay? We are, we all have a common basis and we have a lot of values in common and so on, but I don't want the Eurocrats in Brussels to determine my values, particularly not in one of the most shameful organizations ever in human history, namely the United Nations, where because the barbarians have a majority, barbarian values are, are substituting civilized uh, uh, values. When in the um, Human Rights Council at the UN, you have the Syrians and the Sudanese and the Libyans and the North Koreans, no, actually not the North Koreans, but the Cubans and countries with a majority that is repulsive in terms of values and Europe is saying, but this is the international community and we must abide by the international community. This is something that the Czech Republic can say, you need 28 countries to agree, we don't agree. Here is something you can do, not in the Middle East. Done. Yes, please. Um, my name is Roman Joch, and I teach at this college, too. Dr. Shiftan, I share your outlook and appreciate your presentation very much indeed, and would like to ask you a question concerning another country, and perhaps another culture, which is Iran. And the question is not dealing, emphatically is not dealing with the nuclear issue. The question is completely different. Um, in Iran, under the old regime before 1979, uh, that country was capable of being friendly towards the West. Do you think that with another regime, another possible regime in Iran, uh, that country could switch sides, so to speak, again? Thank you. Thank you for this question, but let me preface my answer by saying that I don't speak Farsi. I have not studied the Iranian society remotely as much as I've studied the uh, Arab society so that I can speak based on the little I know independently and a lot that I've learned from people I respect as scholars who study Iran. And I would say the following. The tremendous, the deep difference between Iran and the Arab world is in Iran you have a barbaric regime and a healthy society. In the Arab world, you have repulsive regimes and a sick society. In the Arab uh, countries, the alternative to the repulsive regimes is in most cases worse than these regimes. In Iran, if we have a profound change of regime, scholars that I respect, that have studied Iran, tell me that 70 percent, two-thirds of the Iranians want to live in a pluralistic society. I cannot judge it independently, but everybody I respect tells me, that, tells me that this is true. Iran can be the great hope 
of the Middle East. And here is the interesting paradox. Iran could be the next Turkey and Turkey can be the next Iran. In other words, in Iran, you may get something as positive as we have seen with the Ataturk revolution until Erdogan came. And since Erdogan, I'm afraid that we have the making in, in Turkey, if Erdogan remains in power, of an Iran-like situation. I'm delighted that Erdogan failed in everything he touched. And I hope his economy will also go down the drain because that will be a joy. And I believe that this will undermine the terrible things that he's doing. And in Turkey, you have tens of millions of people with values like yours and mine, okay? That, have, that are really European in the sense that they have adopted these values, but the majority that Erdogan managed to... Uh, uh, to mobilize is unfortunately very different. So Turkey is a danger and Iran is a hope. Now, one of the mistakes we should seek not to repeat is to expect perfection. Was the Shah of Iran cruel and sometimes stupid? Yes. So, I am only interested in what the alternative is. If my alternative is between something repulsive and bad and something catastrophic, I will always support the repulsive. And by the way, in politics, this is your real choice. You don't get to make choices in politics between the perfectly good and the, the perfectly evil. You have a choice between the repulsive and the catastrophic. Always choose the repulsive which is why politicians have to learn to deal with the repulsive. If you're incapable of dealing with the repulsive, don't go into politics. Or to quote Harry Truman, if you can't stand the heat, don't come in the kitchen. Okay? This is what you need to do. Now, of course, the job of the politician is also to manipulate the people because they can't understand it. So tell them whatever they believe and do the right thing. They asked uh, Tito... How do you have socialism in Yugoslavia? I said, it's very simple. I'm driving the car, I'm signaling to the left, I'm turning to the right. That's fine. Because your choices must be responsible, not pure. If you have a pure politician, he is, I think it's better to say, if you have a perfect politician, you have a perfect idiot. <laughs> By the way, he has a name. He's called Jimmy Carter. Okay? <laughs> I can't think of somebody, even Obama is much better than Jimmy Carter because at least he's on the right side. He doesn't know what he's doing, but he's on the right side. Carter was on the wrong side. And he brought the Shah down. And the inevitable substitute to the Shah was Khomeini. If it were as a substitute to the Shah, Albert Schweitzer, I would have supported it. But unfortunately, he was not available. <laughs> nice. uh, my name is Cipan Konopasek. I come from Charles University. And Dr. Shuftan, uh, what, is, what do you think about uh, peace initiative of Miko Pellet? Uh, who is our, Miko Pellet, the, the son of, of the famous uh, Israeli general? Uh, his peace initiative, he is arguing for uh, peace uh, settlement. Miko Pellet, he, he comes from Israel, son of uh, General Pellet. He is the son of, Thank you. of uh, Pellet, who himself was a radical that is negligible and a non entity, he's even more of a non entity. There is no such thing. Okay? I mean, even if somebody has some initiative, it is. It is a non-entity, okay? If I don't know about it, it doesn't exist. <laughs> it's it's um, some radical with some fantasy. I don't know. There, there are two questions here and there in the back. Uh, good evening. Uh, I am a student of Metropolitan University and 
I just want to say that I heavily disagree with uh, your opinion that your view is some kind of general general opinion because I know many Arabs and I don't know any of them who would agree with uh, with this uh, Zionist point of view. So, uh, and I have been to many Arabic states. I have been to Lebanon, I have been to Palestinian territories and to Jordan and to Syria as well. And also, um, uh, if we came to Mikko Pellet, he, he claims that uh, the two-state solution between Palestine and Israel is um, it's, it's not going to work. It, it's what you said as well, and um, I believe so. And I think that the, the one-state solution would be a good, good way to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he don't. He doesn't agree with uh, the with the Zionist point of view. Yes. So he wants to destroy Israel and to make Israel into an Arab state. No, that's not true at all. And don't care what he tells you. This is the inevitable consequence of what he's suggesting, because what he wants is to uh, allow the right of return. There will be an Arab majority. It will be an Arab state, and well, it will be an Arab state that will kill the Jews. Well, it's very simple. Uh, well, it, there is an Arab majority already, Look. but it's very suppressed because the okay. Israeli community uh, is making basically a genocide. So I would like ah, to say we that... We have a genocide. Okay. Let I me just like ask know. you this. If we would have wanted to kill the Palestinians, how long would it take? Two hours? Two days? Two weeks? And what, we're working at it 140 years and we haven't succeeded? Look, this, the whole thing is ridiculous, okay? The meaning of this is zero. I agree with you on one thing. You have spoken to many Arabs, and Arabs don't accept Zionism. By the way, Shiite Arabs don't accept Sunni Arabs. Sunni Arabs don't accept Shiite Arabs. Yes. Muslim Arabs don't accept Christian Arabs. They butcher each other, they kill each other, they want to kill us, and we won't let them. And you can have well, can these ideas, say... and the significance of it is less than zero. Well, okay? I agree that the Arabic um, community is very divided, but uh, you cannot expect to come to a country to start to genocide its people. I don't expect them anything. I will live. And anybody who threatens me, I will break his face. It's very simple. Okay? Well, that's exactly I'm not what the Arabic people do. In, look, analytically, I'm interested in Arab views who want to kill the Jews. Analytically, because professionally, I study it. But politically speaking, I know they want to kill me, and I will not let them. And if you believe that destroying me is a good idea, or you believe that I should accept their view about what I must be, I will not. Okay? And, and that's it. And it's not open for discussion. It's simply not open for discussion. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I have... Maybe somebody who spoke with others. Good evening. I'm also from Metropolitan University, and I would like to ask uh, about your opinion for... Okay. I would like to ask you about your opinion about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. What do you think? How can it be solved? How it can be solved, if it can be? And uh, what do you expect to happen? Thank Look, you. I think it, it cannot be solved because the Palestinians want to solve it by finishing our existence. And it has a name, it is called the right of return. Basically, they say, first give us a Palestinian state and then we will destroy the Jewish state by bringing in millions of Palestinians. Okay? And this will not happen. They will not abandon this and we will not let it happen. So there is no solution. What I want to achieve, and here I'm giving you my political opinion, what I want to achieve is to get rid of the Palestinian population, including the territory they sit on. 
And because they will not agree to a partition that will allow me to live, I want to leave this area unilaterally, the way I did in the Gaza Strip, mutatis mutandis, because I cannot take the Israeli army out for a long time, not because they deserve it, they don't, not because it will bring peace, it will not, but because I don't want to cohabitate with them. So I want to tell them I'm going out and you have a state or a shmate or whatever you want and when you'll try to attack me, I'll break you. Okay? Which is what we will do anyway. We left the Gaza Strip. They tried to kill as many Jews as possible. They are anti-Semites with an anti-Semitic platform, with an anti-Semitic constitution. Their constitution includes the protocols of the elders of Zion. They say all Jews need to be killed. They don't even hide it. They say you need to kill all the Jews. Okay? So what will I do? I will not go over there and convince them, love me. Okay? If they will love me, I will feel very uncomfortable. I actually enjoy that they hate me because if somebody that I have only disrespect and disdain for hates me, it's a badge of honor. I don't want them to love me. I want them to leave me alone. If they will leave me alone, fine. If they will attack me, I'll break their face. Okay? And I will do whatever it takes to prevent them from killing me. This is the Israeli position today, vis-a-vis -vis Gaza. And I want to have something similar. The West Bank is more complicated, so you need something more specific. The West, I want something similar in the West Bank to say, we have an enemy in the West Bank. The Palestinians are an enemy. As long as the enemy is afraid of me, I leave them alone. The moment the enemy tries to attack me, I will destroy them. By the way, this is the same attitude that I have towards Lebanon. Hezbollah, another anti-Semitic, repulsive, barbarian organization, wants to kill all Jews. Since 2006, they have not attacked Israel because they're afraid of me. If they will attack me, I will destroy them. I don't expect them to make peace. I don't expect a solution. I know that I live in a region where nobody has a solution, nobody has peace, nobody can live with, in peace. We are not living in Switzerland, okay? We live in the Middle East. Our neighbors are not Norwegians. Our neighbors are Arabs, and we see how they treat each other, and this is how they try to treat us. And we don't need a solution, although it would be very nice to have one, we can live without it, okay? Look, all of us know that there are certain things in our life that we don't like and we cannot change. So what do we do? We, somebody has diabetes. Does it have a solution for this one individual? No, so what does he do? He injects himself with insulin every day, right? I think so, it's diabetes, right, and insulin, I'm not sure. Okay, is it the solution? No. Can he live a productive life by injecting himself with insulin every day? Yes, so you do it. When you're looking for ideal solutions, you will very often end in a dead end. I am much more modest in what I expect from myself. I don't expect to make a problem go away I expect to be able to do what is important for me, even if it doesn't go away. And I mentioned before what is important for me. A better democracy, a better economy, a better culture, a better science, everything worth living for. I'm not living to defeat Arabs. I'm not living to be loved by Arabs. My life is, the Arabs are irrelevant to my life with one exception with the threat that they present to me. I only want them to leave me alone, and in the, mid in the Middle East, the best way to be left alone is to be strong and to demonstrate that if people attack you, they cannot afford the consequences. 
And by the way, let me tell you something very interesting. It may sound very gloomy to you, but Israel, from all the OECD countries, is the most optimistic country among all the OECD countries. We have a huge public opinion poll every year done by the um, uh, Central Bureau of Statistics. You know that for the population of Israel, when you sample it, you need 508 people. The sample of this public opinion poll is 33,500 people. It's huge, about 50 times more than you need. And you ask people, what do you think of uh, Israel? And they say, oh, this doesn't work and this doesn't work because in Israel you complain. If you stop complaining, they revoke your Israeli citizenship. I mean, this is our national sport. I, I don't like to do physical sport, but complaining is great. I, I get up in the morning and I complain. And then they ask people, after having said that this is not good and this is not good, how is your life? And they say, oh, my life is great. Okay? I have a good life. What will be next year? It will be even better. What will be in five years? It will be even better. Israel has a negligible proportion of people who leave Israel. And again, the media are lying about it. We have two per mil, which is the second lowest in the OECD. More people leave Germany. I haven't looked up the Czech Republic, but more people leave Germany than leave Israel. Okay? Because Israelis have a good life. And by the way, it's very easy to leave Israel. I have a European passport. I speak all the languages. I can be offered a job anywhere in the world. Would I leave Israel? No way. I love it too much. We are masochists, okay? We enjoy quarreling with each other. We enjoy disagreeing with each other. We enjoy being arrogant, as you may have seen this evening. And it's fun, okay? So the Arabs can make it somewhat difficult, but not so difficult that you say, without peace I cannot live. It would be nice to have peace. And without peace, it's not so nice. So what? On this happy note. Thank you very, very much on behalf of, I think, everybody here. Uh, it was projected for 90 minutes, and uh, it's two hours now. So thank you all uh, for coming. Thank you for raising uh, the provoking question, provoking uh, the speaker to uh, the great answers, uh, including this visionary question, which has produced one of the greatest answers on the visionary question what I ever, ever heard. Uh, when I was preparing for this uh, evening, I, I uh, checked the internet and some uh, leftist uh, opponent of you has written that he's like, he looks like a John Bolton, he's like a John Bolton. I don't know whether you know who's John Bolton. He was a American, well, he's an American diplomat who was serving for Reagan administration and then for young Bush administration. I must tell after those two hours that you are much better than John Bolton. <laughs> And uh, thank you, thank you very much for this great amount of the deep conservative thinking about the greater Middle East. I think it's uh, rarely uh, heard in uh, Prague, it's rarely heard in, in Europe, and uh, we are really grateful to you uh, for being with us. And once again, thank you very, very much. Thank you.